Welcome everyone. We're back for this week's installment of Saints. Um, with me today, I have Sean Rapier. Sean, wave your hands. Hello. <laughs> Welcome everyone. We're back for this week's installment of Saints. And we have some feedback. So somebody is got... trying to share it because as soon as I went on to Facebook, to oh. share, I started playing. So no worries. No yeah. worries. I can do it without it. Do the same thing. Wonderful. Well, Sean, we've got you and Jenny Noon and I. Hi. Say hello to everyone. How's um, it going? Awesome. So we're gonna we're gonna uh, talk about chapters twelve and thirteen. But before we do, we'd love to know where you're watching from. So tell us in the comments below where you might be watching from. Also, if you've read chapters twelve and thirteen, we'd love for you to comment, and uh, we'll. We'll see those comments live. We'll drop those up so you can see yourself on screen. And we'd love you to uh, participate in our discussion today. So before we go any further, though, we'd love to get to know our first guest, Sean Rapier, a little bit more. Sean, can you give us a little overview? Yeah. Hi. I'm Sean Rapier. Uh, I am the host of the Latter-day Lives podcast, where we get amazing guests like John and Jenny Noonan die. We get all the top talent, basically Latter-day Saint talent. It's a uh, weekly podcast, comes out every Monday. We, uh, just anyone with a great story who's an active member of the church, we have come on and tell their story and it's fantastic. I also have a Facebook live group that's uh, a few comedians get together. It's called uh, Linger Longer Live. And we just sit, we choose a topic and we kind of just riff on it, you know, talk about uh, Latter-day Saint culture, and I think I'm, even though it was 10 years ago, it's sad that I, I haven't done anything better since then, but I think I'm most well known for uh, Latter-day Night Live, which I did with Michael Berklin and Jeff Burke and Dave Nively and Adam Johnson, a bunch of us. We did some uh, Latter-day Saint comedy, stand-up comedy, and that's actually still available at certain Deseret Books or on YouTube. So that's who I am, and I'm just excited to be here. Awesome. Sean, thank you. Appreciate you being here. Jenny, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, I, uh, my name is Jenny Noonan Dye, and bios are my least favorite thing. I am watching from the Salt Lake City, Utah area, or if you're John Dye, I am upstairs. <laughs> um, I... <laughs> I have a blog, uh, which barely knows what year it is, formerlyfred.com. That's F-O-R-M-E-R-L-Y-P-H-R-E-A-D.com. And that's also my Instagram handle, my Twitter handle. So follow me there. I also am a contributor to the weekly podcast, The Mormon News Report. You can find it on all your podcast feeds. The Mormon News Report, which I record weekly with Brant Malone, who is out of the Detroit area. And yes, I know we're using the word Mormon. We're still praying about it. Thank you for your patience. Yes. Yes. Very good. Very good. Well, Sean, you've been kind enough to uh, uh, summarize chapter 12 to read through that and uh, give us your thoughts. So, Traditionally, that's where we begin. We'll summarize it and then discuss it a little bit. And then Jenny, you'll have chapter 13, and then we'll discuss that a little bit. Again, please let us know where you're watching in the comments below. And also, if you have any things you want to add to our discussion, feel free to do so. So, Sean, it's all yours. You got it. All right. So uh, a little bit of uh, a recap. We're in Kirtland, Ohio at this time. And by the way, John and Jenny... Uh, I have a real tendency to butcher things and get things wrong and say a name when I'm thinking another name. So feel free to just buzz. Just, <laughs> <laughs> just correct me. So, uh, what I love about Chapter 12 a little bit, to give a recap, you know, we're in Kirtland, Ohio at this time, and they, they give kind of a lot of attention at the beginning uh, to seven-year-old Emily Partridge, and they talk a lot about her home, and by the way, with great restraint, we will not refer to the Partridge family other than to refer to them as uh, this incredible family, and, and Edward Partridge and Lydia Partridge, uh, who are the parents, are just amazing. But it goes into a lot of detail to talk about just how incredible their, their home was, that they have this beautiful, amazing home, 
And as they start bringing saints in to their home from saints who came over from New York, how they get sick and yet how their father still keeps uh, welcoming these saints in and just what a difficult time it was. They kind of had it all there in Kirtland. They had a successful business and they had this beautiful home and yet he was, um, he was the bishop and uh, was just an awesome man. It then cuts to Polly Knight and we hear the story of Polly Knight. Um, she came over with the Colesville Saints uh, from New York and settled on uh, Lehman Copley's land. So Lehman Copley was a convert. You know, it's funny we say convert, they're pretty much all converts at this time, pretty much at this point. Uh, but they all settle on Lehman Copley's land and he's got uh, 700 acres. And it just seems like the perfect situation there in Kirtland that they've got these 700 acres, they start to build homes, they start to build buildings and businesses and everything's gonna be good. And, and uh, Polly gets there, Bishop Partridge, uh, who we just talked about, everything's going great. And uh, then all of a sudden, uh, Lehman Copley says, uh-uh, I'm out. I want nothing to do with the church anymore and get off my property. He literally pulled a kid. Get off my lawn. Exactly, Jenny. That's exactly what made me think of. So he does this, and all of a sudden there are, there's nowhere for these saints to go. Now, all these saints come from, from the Colesville Ward there in, in, um, in New York. And so what do they do? They all go to Joseph. And, you know, you think about the pressure on Joseph at this time. And so Joseph, uh, basically, he's trying to get, you know, a little bit of confirmation. What do we do? We don't really have a place here in Kirtland anymore. And uh, he gets the revelation that it's time to go to Independence, Missouri. It's time to take off. And they talk a lot about Polly. And I like Polly's faith in that uh, she says, she got very sick, by the way. And she says, uh, even though she was only 55 years old, she says, I'm not dying until we get to Zion. I'm not dying until we actually get to Missouri. And that was it. And so some went by land, some went by sea, and they head out um, out to Independence. And it's interesting, kind of a, a story, the story kind of splits here between two people. Um, one of them is Ezra Booth. And Ezra Booth was a minister who had seen a miracle and he had seen Joseph Smith basically bless a woman and her hands, her arms were healed right in front of his eyes. And he said, bam, I'm in. That's, this must be the true church because he saw this. And so he goes to uh, Missouri and so does this Bishop Ed Partridge, whose daughter we were talking about. And Bishop Partridge is this faithful man. They all get to Missouri together and it's gorgeous. It's beautiful hills and everything else. They think this is perfect. They get to Independence, and as they walk into Independence, they go, "What is this place? What? What? We wait a minute. We left Ohio for this. Like, it was this little town filled, and it was a crossroad. It was basically a stopover for people to go down trails and go to other places. And it was a pretty rough and tumble crowd. Uh, a lot of really uh, ruffians, much like downtown Provo, is how I see it. No." Um, How dare you? I would not compare it with Bella. But uh, no, it's, it's uh, so, but what's interesting is there's kind of a split there. They all get there. And what's funny is Ed Partridge, who's this incredibly faithful man, questions Joseph Smith and questions the revelation, says, really, this is where we're supposed to go? Ezra Booth, who has been converted, he questions it and says, this is where we're supposed to be? And Joseph Smith questions it. <laughs> they look at it, they're looking at Joseph Smith, and Joseph Smith says, really, this is where we're supposed to be? And they all have to go back and, uh, and get this confirmation. In fact, uh, it's interesting. I love this. Joseph Smith takes his concerns to the Lord and says, when will the wilderness bloom as the rose? When will Zion be built up in her glory? Where will thy temple stand? It, it, I love this because even Joseph Smith, who led these people there, he had his questions and his doubts. Um, and so they, they start coming in, though. There's kind of a split, uh, which is part of what we'll talk about in a minute. But Ezra Booth basically is so frustrated he can't get over it. He says, well, this means that 
Joseph Smith must not be a prophet. Whereas um, Ed Partridge, after the questioning, he basically comes back around to his faith and says, look, I, I shouldn't have questioned what I don't know. I know that Joseph Smith's a prophet. And, and that's basically where, where it comes down to. Um, one of the things, a couple of things I love, one, Polly Knight does arrive and sick as she is, she's so sick, in fact, they carry her into independence and she dies and is buried um, in independence. And I think it's such a beautiful testament that she was so, no, I am going to die in independence. And right. she was able to get that. Um, and then a couple of other things. Uh, one of the stories at the end that I think is so interesting, the the men, uh, it's uh, Joseph Smith, it's Oliver Cowdery. Um, it's, uh, who else was in there? Ed Partridge was there, Ezra was there. They go back to Ohio and they go back by river and they go by canoe and they talk about how the first day, it, this is, Every canoe trip I've ever been on, the first day is wonderful. <laughs> day two, they wake up and it is just hot. And these petty battles kind of take off. Um, it's It becomes so petty that some of the men say, well, well guess what? I'm not even paddling because you're so bad at canoeing. And they're fighting amongst themselves and they finally, they finally have to pull over. And this is kind of from what we read, the final straw um, for uh, Ezra Booth. He just says, this thing is such a mess, I'm done. And uh, later they they end up, of course, uh, Independence is the new place. They, they were not going to, going to go back to Ohio. They kind of maintained Ohio for a while. Um, but, uh, and then even after everything else, you know, kind of bookends with uh, the Partridges and, uh, you know, Ed Partridge sends a, a letter back to his wife, Lydia, that is one of the most faithful things I've ever seen. He says, it's not what we thought it was going to be. It's not going to be easy. It's really difficult here, and it's not nearly as nice as what you're used to. Time to pack up and bring the girls and come meet me. Mm. I can't even come get you. I need you to pack up, and you need to come. And that's kind of a quick synopsis. Did I miss anything important in, in Chapter 12, John or Jenny? That's great. Great summary. Je Jenny, any thoughts there that you want to share? Anything that hits you as you went through that chapter? Uh, uh, Sean, that was very thorough. And uh, my review of 13 will, <laughs> I'm sure, pale in comparison, if I'm lucky. Um, I love what you said about... Um, that they did go into quite a bit of detail in describing the Partridge home. Um, and, and also just the kind of, uh, I don't know, was it discouragement? Was it disappointment when they get there and it wasn't what they thought it would be, but thank goodness they didn't have to travel anymore after they got to Missouri. Wait. <laughs> um, so that, that felt like foreshadowing. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I haven't read past chapter 13. So, uh, but yeah, what you said about the canoeing, <laughs> I I thought the same thing when they're like, that they refuse to paddle. Uh, petty much? You grown men? Are you kidding me? Um, but it, it really does show like, that pride can take many forms, and it does. Um so I think I, but I actually think like, like we kind of giggle about it now, but we giggle because it's relatable and that sort of thing, you know, canoe showdown, um, that sort of thing. It's like, um, we can all relate because we all have the same basically human tendencies. And I think, I think we all benefit from kind of humanizing saints, whether they are from the past or the present, um, that way we can not only relate to them, but understand that the atonement is for all. Absolutely. Great, great thought there. Great thought. Um, yeah, a few things that hit me on this chapter, and, and Sean, you hit on a few of these when you were doing your summary, was just the absolute faith that Edward Partridge and Lydia had to have, right? This early hat maker in the, in the church, this convert to the church, and 
um, I believe he was converted, if mm-hmm. I remember correctly, in previous chapters. He and Sidney came down, and before he wanted to be baptized, he wanted to meet uh, Joseph and his family, and literally um, saw that they were uh, a, a thrifty family, but a very hardworking family. And I believe before he was even baptized, if not the day of his baptism, was when he was called to go on his first mission. So the, the amount of faith that that would take and the, um, the number of things that were required, it talked about the measles at the beginning of this chapter and them you know, ingesting or taking in some of the, uh, some of the saints from, from back east into their home. Just, you know, even, even you, can't, you, you can't fault uh, uh, Copley, right? Because he's the one that said, hey, get off my land, get off my uh, lawn. Um, Lehman Copley, knowing that all this was required, boy, that really humanizes this saying there was a lot that was expected out of these individuals uh, early on and they had to do a lot. Um, You know, as I affectionately call it, the canoe showdown. um, Yeah, this this is just very interesting for me because I, I don't believe we would necessarily have heard about something like this when we were growing up. Um, you know, I, I believe most people, at least of, of my age, think, wow, Joseph was the prophet and he, he wasn't uh, questioned much. But these were, were saints, uh, again, that were early converts in the church. And they, they did have questions. And this was a, a young man, a young Joseph, who was leading them. And so uh, it makes sense. Ezra Booth sees a miracle. He converts. He joins the church. And then once he uh, sees maybe some of the, the, uh, the man side of Joseph, so to speak, he then has some questions that uh, causes him to reconsider. And as we know later, he is one of the biggest um, um, opponents to Joseph and actually causes some of the biggest headaches for the church uh, in the near future. So um, anyway, it's kind of an interesting interesting uh, chapter. Again, chapter 12, after much tribulation. So Jenny, shall we go on to chapter 13? Do you wanna do a, a quick summary of that? Yeah, when you say quick, I mean, we'll see what we can get done here. <laughs> sure. But uh, so chapter 13, the title of which is um, The Gift Has Returned talks about kind of the uh, the end of that canoe showdown trip. Uh, they got back to Kirtland and basically Joseph and most of the elders with whom he was traveling did humble themselves. They, they repented um, and they were forgiven. However, Ezra Booth, <laughs> that guy, um, okay. yeah, again, and he, when they got back to Kirtland, he continued to criticize Joseph. And um, before too long, his <laughs> his preaching license was revoked, which I didn't know, like, you can get, a, like, a preaching license. That, may be smart. that, that was just really cool. Right? Yeah. And then like, hand, hand over your bat. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Turn over your bat. Right. Um, and so after that, he was like, well, fine. And he started writing letters. <laughs> uh, still just, just attacking Joseph's character. Uh, but as it says, the Lord rebuked these attacks in early September and called on the elders to stop condemning Joseph's errors and criticizing him without cause. And basically he said, the Lord said, look, yeah, he has sinned. And then that's where we get, you know, the oft quoted DNC 6410, I, the Lord will forgive, for, will forgive whom I will forgive. But it is, what is it? But uh, for you, it's required you, to forgive all yeah. men. Yep. So um, of you, it is required to forgive all men. So then there's more revelation given, basically a lot about, um, about working uh, toward building the cause of Zion and, and, kind of their attitudes about it and not only that, but their obedience and then the blessings that will come from that obedience. Um, A few members were then specifically asked to sell their land in Ohio, but the Lord did uh, tell Joseph to retain a stronghold in the land of Kirtland for the space of five years. 
So then we go on to Elizabeth Marsh, who her husband Thomas was in Independence already, but she, so as she's waiting for him, for his return, uh, she listens, you know, like, tell me what Zion is like. And while they didn't have a lot of good things to say about necessarily the people who live there, they described the the soil being very rich, um, the tumbling prairies, and the river, of course. Um, overall, they were optimistic about what it meant for the future of the Zion that they were all attempting to build together. And then some some information is shared, which I'm guessing you know has been extracted from letters, a letter that specifically she wrote to her sister in Boston about the about the land about the, the temple cornerstone being set and and just kind of again optimism about it um so and then thomas was still in missouri preaching uh bef uh so then we get to now i think one of the most interesting parts of this chapter which introduces william mcclellan william mcclellan uh, lived about, he, well, he was 25 years old and, and he lived Southwest of Kirtland. He, he was a widow and his, uh, his wife, Cynthia, Ann, they'd been married for fewer than two years when both Cynthia and their baby died. So this left him very lonely. He was a man who lost everyone in his family um, but he was a school teacher. He was a writer, kind of quick witted, or I'm sorry, not quick witted. It's a quick mind. I'm guessing he was quick witted. Um, one day he hears a couple of preachers, one of whom is David Whitmer, and they're testifying about having seen an angel about the Book of Mormon. And, and he, being a, a scholar and well spoken himself, was rather impressed. And he wrote in his journal, I've never heard such preaching in all my life. The glory of God seemed to encircle the men or the man, uh, meaning the other preacher, Harvey Whitlock. So being the scholar that he was, he was eager to meet Joseph Smith. And so that he could, you know, kind of uh, talk, talk to him more about the cause as he's any, he, and he gets to know, um, Edward Partridge, Martin Harris, Hiram Smith. And one day he's talking with Hiram as they're going on a walk. And he's saying to Hiram that he, you know, he's like, I really want to believe, but he just, he wasn't convinced. So um, early the next day he, he's praying. And as he was considered, he was, it says reflecting on his study of the book of Mormon, William realized it had opened his mind to new light. He knew then that it was true and felt honor and, and felt honor bound to testify of it. He has, he was certain he had found the living church of Jesus Christ. And the reason I like this is because when he had that realization, it was when he was reflecting on an experience he had already had. He had already read from the book of Mormon and in doing so gained new light, but in considering it, from kind of a um, an intellectual perspective, he didn't think he was convinced. So he had to kind of just take that quiet moment of reflection and realize, oh, I, I have gained truth from this already. So Hiram baptized him and they set out for Kirtland and he became a preacher. And here's another part that I really like about it. Um, it says clearly, again, just kind of humanizing these saints that he could become very arrogant when he preached and that he always felt bad about it. <laughs> like, oh, sorry, yeah, I know, sorry, I'm really smart, sorry. <laughs> um, but, but, actually, but in truth, it was that he felt bad because he recognized that his pride or his arrogance came off as driving the spirit away. And so, it, so even for such a smart and well-spoken man, there was a learning curve for him to incorporate humility into his preaching so as to welcome the spirit in, because that's how the most effective teaching happened. So then there's one more thing where he he really wanted another assurance. And so he had some questions on his mind, but didn't want to ask Joseph directly. So one night they were together and he said, would you, he, he said, would you please ask the Lord for some revelation? And Joseph did. And sure enough, all of his questions were answered. So that was just one more testimony to him of that. 
so um then it talk i i know i've already taken a lot of time time um then they're just talking about how um <laughs> Ezra Booth, gosh, that guy. Um, he had published, he did like an open letter basically saying, well, Joseph's getting all these revelations and he's not even sharing them with the public. And so Joseph was concerned and kind of approached um, some other leaders and said, you know, I think maybe I should, um, I should publish these revelations in a book. And they're, you know, kind of went back and forth about it. Um, they ended up agreeing to publishing, but um, as they were writing the council that he had assembled for this, they were kind of um, critical because Joseph wasn't a learned man. And so they were actually kind of, um, they were worried about the content and the like the grammar the spelling like like a, like because they said joseph had a limited vocabulary and weak grammar and so they're like uh well maybe we should do this and so he's like okay we'll go ahead and write one then and they waited and guess what <laughs> they realized that the lord is going to you know the um he had testified, uh, the, the Lord didn't share their concern. And in, in, the in the preface, he had testified that the revelations came from him, given to his servants, quote, in their weakness after the manner of their language, unquote. So essentially it was like, no, Joseph's my prophet. This is what it's going to be. So um, then the last part here, um, Elizabeth March, uh, Marsh around this time welcomed a traveling preacher, a woman named Nancy Towell in Kirtland. And Nancy was, she's described as a small, wiry woman with large eyes that burned with the intensity of her convictions. At 35, oh, there she is. At 35, Nancy had already made a name for herself preaching to large congregations of women and men in schools, churches, and camp meetings across the United States. So quite a resume. Um, and so she was well-educated, very firm in her beliefs. And the reason she went to Kirtland is that even though she spoke to large congregations and and considered herself to be one who kept an open mind about such things, she was completely sure that the saints were wrong. So she went there to learn, essentially help the resistance against the <laughs> restoration of the gospel. Um, Elizabeth was not cool with that, but she could understand it. She could understand, like, she's like, well, we don't agree, but okay. Like I, I get what you're trying to do. Um, so, so she, so Nancy and Elizabeth attended a confirmation meeting with Joseph, Sidney and other church leaders. And at the meeting, uh, William Phelps went up to her and was like, um, you're not going to be saved unless you believe the book. And she, <laughs> I love this. Nancy glared at William if I had that book, sir, I would burn it. Um, and she she was just so like blown away that all these intelligent people could, what she considered, be duped by this young prophet and his new religion. So she approached, she actually approached Joseph Smith and said, um, Mr. Smith, can you, in the presence of Almighty God, give your word by oath that an angel from heaven showed you the place of those place of place of those plates and he said i will not swear at all and then he went around and um confirmed a bunch of people he had just baptized so um so then at that point elizabeth looked at nancy and she's like you know what when he, when i was confirmed i received the holy ghost and i felt it just like warm water had been poured over me and that's what he's doing with these people right now and nancy got offended by that because she was like, kind of, how dare you? I know what the spirit feels like. Um, and so she went back to Joseph and said, are you not ashamed of such pretensions? You who are no more than any ignorant plowboy of our land. And then she dropped the mic because burn. And then Joseph just very simply, and you know, I it doesn't say here in the book, but I will say boldly testified, the gift has returned back again as in former times, to illiterate fishermen. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, good stuff. Good stuff. <laughs> Love it. Great stuff. Hey, let's, uh, Sean, what, what uh, from chapter 13 impressed you the most? We'd love to hear from you. All right. So first of all, can I just say that uh, chapters 12 and 13, this time in church history, um, to bring it into something very modern, this is the Empire Strikes Back. Of <laughs> history. You know, everything yep. is falling apart. I mean, this is one of those times where you're kind of looking for where's that bright light? Not really there. Um, and so I, I just, I love 13. I think that first of all, one of the things I love about the 12 and 13, it's, it's been every chapter so far, but one of the things I love about the saints in general is that much like in the Book of Mormon, we've got, you know, Nephi and Ammon and Alma the Younger, and we've got heroes, and much like in the Bible, we've got heroes, History, the number of heroes has been a lot smaller. We, we kind of, we know certain stories. We know their stories well because they're in the Doctrine and Covenants or, you know, we've heard them. I love all these stories that are coming up. Um, I'll just say there's a whole process. The fact that Ezra Booth, uh, one thing I will say on a personal note, my grandparents um, on my mom's side, moved their entire family to Canada and then to the U.S. just for the church. That was it. It was so that their kids could be around more church members. They moved from uh, from uh, Australia all the way to the U.S. for this. Later left the church and became quite antagonistic to the church, had their uh, names removed and really were not happy that we stayed in. Wow. It can happen to anybody. So it's easy to look at Ezra Booth. And one of the things I look at, though, is, you know, he became converted over a miracle. I don't know Ezra Booth. I don't know his story enough. But I see that he became converted over a miracle. Sometimes we look for those things. And then if it doesn't continue on, it's easy. But I would say that this is a cautionary tale to every single one of us to be very careful uh, about our testimony. It becomes so easy to become bitter about the Lord's anointed when things are not going to go our way. Uh, in 13, my favorite, favorite, favorite part of this, and I don't know if the writers uh, who wrote this meant this to with a smile, but it's one of my favorite things. When they're talking about whether or not these prophecies should be published and how should they be published, um, and it says that uh, several members of the council said they were willing to testify. Some were reluctant. They knew he was a prophet, but ah, he's limited. The next verse starts with, or the next uh, uh, paragraph starts with, uh, the Lord did not share their concern. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. that is one of my favorite things ever written. And I think sometimes we tend to get, like when we get upset about things or we overanalyze things and we go, oh, oh no, what's going to happen with this and that? kind of doesn't matter. Yeah. The Lord has a plan. We tend to think in this age, especially where, you know, we have so many forms of communication, like that all opinions are equal. And I love that it just says, yeah, the Lord did not share their concern. So here's what actually happened. Um, you know, and it, that happens on, uh, by the way, every time my family goes out to dinner. <laughs> my kids say, but what about this? I say, I don't share your concerns. <laughs> um, but I, I just love that. And then the final story, you know, it's so, the, the spirit is so simple. The spirit is so beautiful when it says, I felt the Holy Ghost as warm water go over me. And yet we want to overanalyze it. We want to overthink it. And I just think that's one of the most beautiful verses because that's how I feel about the Holy Ghost is it's like warm water rushing over me. So love, love, love this chapter. And bravo, Jenny. Like that was so perfect, that recap of it. Awesome. Hey, yes. thanks. Yes, thank you. You did a great job. Um, Jenny, do you want to spend any more time on any of those points? Or did you give all your editorial comment during the summary? Uh, unless there are comments from those who are joining us online. Well, from you, John got, Dye. well, let's do this. Let's actually show where some people are watching from. We've got Celesi, Celesi Tale, Talepa from the Gold Coast in Australia. We've got somebody from... Puerto Rico, 
Elizabeth. Hola. Franklin. Hola. Lori Jennings from St. George, Utah. Ooh, love St. George. Lori Caraway from Kentucky. Um, Brandon Shirley says, Sean, wave hi. Hey, so Brandon. Brandon's a good man. Do you know Brandon? All right, good. Yeah. We've got Bonnie Brandon Like. Man. Yep. Awesome. Bonnie Like from South Carolina, Stephanie Hatch Leishman. She says, thanks for all of this. And Tom Jensen up from uh, the Boise area. So, so that's great. Awesome. Yeah, well, I'll just, I'll, I'll share a few thoughts if that's all right before we jump off. But yeah, chapter 13, I thought was very, very interesting. I guess all the chapters are, but um, you know, it's the, the Ezra Booth thing is, is really interesting to me. Obviously, this is a man who had been a preacher and, in the previous chapter, it said, how could the Lord entrust the keys of the kingdom to individuals such as this? And it's, it's very clear that, um, you know, Joseph was a man. He, was, he had foibles. He had issues. He, he was a man as well as a prophet. But, um, you know, it, it's very easy, I think, in our day, too, to, to look at the chinks in the armor, so to speak, of some of our leaders as we see them. But Again, if we have the faith to know that they have been given the keys of the kingdom, that they have been given the keys to lead us, I think that is key and crucial. And that's one reason why I think obedience is the first law of heaven. Um, Ezra, he probably could have done quite a few things better than Joseph. Um, but again, if he would have lent his talents and assistance to uh, to the kingdom and to what uh, the Lord was was creating, I, I think it would have just been incredible. And, and unfortunately, he became a, uh, an opponent to Joseph, as we know, and in doing all the things that he did. Um, I also think it's very interesting, too, as we talk about wanting to get all of those um, uh, commandments and all of those things published, because at that point, you had to handwrite those that if you were a missionary going out into the field. You know, the council that came together, David Whitmer and a few others opposed publishing revelations because, again, they were worried that it might make the Lord's plans for building Zion more public. Um, as you mentioned, Sean, the Lord didn't share those concerns. But uh, again, I think we would be astounded if we were able to if we were able to glimpse into the uh, Quorum of the Twelve and maybe even the, the 15. I, you know, a lot of times I think we we think everyone is of the same opinion and that they agree on everything. And I think robust discussion, and I might even drop in the word argument, um, positive argument or um, very robust discussion is a good thing. I think we have people with different backgrounds in life and different views on things. And I think at the end of the day, uh, the way that the church is, is, uh, is structured um, we know that we follow the prophet and whatever the decision is from him, we feel is, is something we should do and move forward with. But love the fact that we have everyone with these diverse backgrounds that can give their input on things. And I think that's really important. Um, and the last point that I'll make is really the Nancy Towell incident, right? Someone that, uh, she's, she's known as being a feminist for the time, which, uh, I think is is great that she was doing some wonderful things. Came to Kirtland and um, I'd never heard of Nancy before I read her um, her account, this account of Nancy and others in Saints. So it was very interesting to me to read about her and about what uh, what her thoughts were about what was happening. And I think she probably um, represents uh, a large contingent at this time, right? I think people from afar were watching this interesting little um, thing called Mormonism being formed and these followers of Joseph Smith reading uh, copies of the Book of Mormon and seeing this uh, society be created. And I, I think uh, many of them were incredulous. They were saying, wow, how can you be duped as she did? You know, many of these people were learned. They were, were smart individuals. Um, and I, I think she represents a much larger contingent than we're even aware of. But again, I love, like you, like you said, uh, both of you actually, no sooner his hands fell upon my head than I felt the Holy Ghost as warm water go over me. And I think that's one interesting thing is regardless of how intellectual we are 
as people, as individual people, there's something you can't deny when you have felt the spirit. Um, if you're true to yourself, if you're true to the way you feel, even if it seems extremely illogical, which quite honestly, sometimes it does in some ways, right? Um, as, as you think through certain things and you just don't put uh, one and one together all the time, the way things happen in the gospel. But it's very interesting to me that when you feel the, the Holy Ghost and have that confirmed upon you, that that is truth. It's something you can't deny. It's something you can't turn your back on and, and be true to yourself. So love the, the end line. Jenny, you, you talked about that. The gift has returned back again, as in former times, to illiterate fish, fishermen. So something that, uh, you know, the, the Lord, we know he doesn't choose those who, who are the smartest individuals necessarily, who, who have the most funds, uh, some people that uh, I think the world would consider the, the, the learned and the most uh, uh, able to do things. The Lord doesn't look, look upon that. He looks on the heart. And I, I think that's what he did with Joseph. And so that was extremely important. Well, let's give you guys some final thoughts here. Sean, should we defer to you to, to say a few things? So uh, just a, a few final thoughts. First of all, this was really fun getting together with you guys for this, so thank you. This is uh, going to be my first model for the new third hour at home. This is the model. For it. Awesome. I hope that we'll actually kind of do this with families. Like I think third hour could be this, get, get a couple families together and have a discussion together online. I think it's awesome. Um, secondly, I am just while we were working, I just filed a trademark for the great Latter Day Paddle Battle of 1831. <laughs> <laughs> that is officially what it is going to be known. No, paddle battle. The great, yeah, the great Latter Day Paddle Battle of 1831. I'm, I'm trademarking and I'm writing a book about it. Um, no, I, I, I love that they included that. This is to me. What has been missing for my love of church history is these little nuggets and these little stories. I would say, in summary, the greatest thing I took out of this, um, you know, the, the stories of Edward Partridge and Ezra Booth, and Ezra Booth and, and Ed Partridge both kind of carry through 12 and 13. And to me, the great thing is to realize these are two men who went through the same thing. They both were called to go to independence. They were both called to be uncomfortable. They were both were called to leave their homes. Seemingly, Ed had a little bit more to give up, but I don't know Ezra's whole background. But they both got there, and they both had the same reaction. And this is what's so interesting. They had the same reaction, same response, same everything. And then that's where they diverged. They, they were in the same canoe. But where they diverged, where they diverged is that Ed repented, and Ezra hardened his heart. And what's interesting is it's a tiny little divergence. If you look at what they did, it's just a tiny, they were on the same exact path. We're both believers, we're both members, we're both converted, we're both going to independence. We both think this is the wrong place. We're both disappointed, we're both disillusioned. And then they get called on to repent and Ezra says no, and Ed says yes. And that tiny little divergence takes them in such massive different directions. And I think the wonderful cautionary tale is it could be every one of us. And what I walk away with is I just pray that the Lord will strengthen me to stay humble and to stay strong, notwithstanding my doubts, and to remember that uh, the Holy Ghost really is just its that warm water. We don't have to look for the deepest of deep. We just have to, to look for that spirit and, gosh, really respect the Lord's anointed. That's what I walk away from these chapters with. Absolutely. That's that's great instruction. Yes, the compare contrast between a few of the, the characters in the early restoration is is very beneficial. So good job with that. Jenny, any final thoughts? Yeah, I really like uh, what Sean just said, because he's right. I mean, I, it brings to mind, you know, uh, President Elder Uchtdorf talking about how just a, a degree can set a flight on a completely different pattern just one change of degree of direction or even or even um robert frost's poem about uh, you know the road not taken so um we all have agency which is one of the greatest gifts 
we've been given. Um, but something you said before, John, about, you know, about the Lord looking, uh, you know, talking about Joseph and looking on his heart. He also looked on Ezra's heart. I mean, mm -hmm. when he rebuked those criticisms in September of that year, he was saying, look, I'll forgive all of you. Like you have to ask and do it and I'll do the same. You all have to forgive each other. But if you want to be forgiven, but if you want forgiveness, then here's what you have to do. And I actually think that was that was quite a grace. I mean, looking at what we know of his actions, they weren't you know, taken advantage of, uh, but we're all given that opportunity and that's important to remember. Wonderful. Great thoughts, great thoughts from both of you. Okay, so thank you for joining us both. Uh, both of you, Jenny thank you. and Sean. Thank you. Uh, next week, everyone gear up for chapters 14 and 15. <laughs> and I read this digitally, so I don't even know how far through the, the thick book we are. Uh, but I think we're, if we're not nearing halfway, I believe we are, we are close to it. But uh, continue to join us. We'll have additional guests on. Again, next week will be chapters 14 and 15. So until next time. We're signing off and we will see you next Sunday. Thanks everyone.